but in a minute or so, I'm going to try and just run through a few small housekeeping matters while we get going. Um, I can see people are still signing up in the waiting room. We will be keeping everybody's microphone off. Um, so if you want to speak, you need to use the chat. We will be using the chat mostly. I'm sure many people now are very familiar with Zoom. So I'm not going to go into all the details. If, if, you, if you want to change your Zoom name to make it more useful, that's very good. If you have a problem on Zoom, it's always best to, to restart. Um, your video is optional and we will be recording the whole event. So everything that goes in the audio, the video and the chat, including private chats, will be available afterwards to help us as we do our, 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 our um, reporting. So just as, as new people are arriving, I can see that we're up to uh, 150 or so people. These are a few technical tips for us as we get going. So if you can please, um, if you can please be aware of those. I'm just going to go back to the screen here. You should be seeing the screen. I've somehow lost control of the Zoom here. Are you still seeing my screen, everybody? Yes? Yes. I still see your screen. Thanks. Yeah, suddenly it was all it disappeared. Okay, good. Um, so these are the technical things. We will be using chat a lot. So if you would like to to, vote, to um, say hello in the chat, you're most welcome to do that. Um, it would be great if you could introduce yourself. Maybe you can type in the chat your name, where you work. And we do have a question for you. I'm hoping I can post it into the chat here. Um, I'm struggling a little bit for some reason today with my computer. I don't know why that would be. Let's post it into the chat. There's all kinds of things I don't want here. We're wanting you, please, if you can post in the chat. Um, one second, there's a Okay, let me keep on going here. Here we go. Name and affiliation. If you can post in the chat, why is integrated pest and disease management important to you or your institution today? If you can just quickly introduce yourselves, what's your name, what's your affiliation? Give us, tell us the answer to the question. I can see people are coming from Lima, from Malaysia, from Indonesia. So it's good morning and it's a good evening to you far away people. If you can post to note, just quickly in the chat, why is integrated pest and disease management important to you or your institution? Why are you here today with us? Um, hello from Scotland, thank you very much. Yep, Labrador, Bhutan, my goodness, Siat, we're coming from all over, Angelica, great. Tell us who you are, where you're coming from, and if you have a moment, tell us why this topic is important to you as we go on. What I'm going to do now is just uh, introduce the whole event. This is the third of a series of four webinars. The main focus today is pest and disease management. Um, what we're trying to do is to inform you. We'll be sharing with you some interesting insights and lessons from different organizations. We want to illustrate what we mean, what the challenges are, what the opportunities are, and we hope to inspire you to take some action. And I hope, of course, we will have some interactions. Um, just to remind you, we will be um, using the chat. So if you have comments and questions and suggestions, please post everything in the chat. We won't be having uh, open microphones. Um, we're trying to keep a little bit of a good timing. What to expect today? We've got four speakers for you covering four, four big key questions. We want you to really active listen, to actively interact. We're really going to use the chat for that. So please post as we go through comments and queries and reactions. Use the chat, post everything in the chat. Our speakers have been prepared. So if you ask specific comments and questions, they will reply to you in the chat. We won't be giving the microphone. So if somebody has their hand up to speak, we won't be um, giving the microphone. We will have some chat interactions. We will have some polls for you. Our moderator will do some reflections. We'd like to give a special welcome to our YouTube audience. If you're not here in the Zoom, we're happy that you're watching. And as we've said before, the whole thing will be recorded. Um, please post in the chat. I hope you're posting those nice introductions, telling us who you are. Just to remind you that the chat is really um, the main mechanism we want to interact with. We are, uh, really appreciate your contributions. We are not providing attendance certificates. There's no formal training in part of this. Please don't use the chat to apply for jobs. Really, this we want to talk about plant health. We want to talk about integrated pest and disease management. 
So please be very respectful. And you know, many people are here and we want to be a very nice, collaborative, open, trusting environment. So let me keep on going. Uh, I was asked to share um, some of the points since this is a series of four webinars. This is number three. The first one was all about uh, climate change and pests uh, and diseases and plant health. So I just wanted to share here a few points there. And basically what we concluded at the end of that was that there's a really urgent, that there's enormous challenges and threats that are coming to our plant health caused by climate change. For research, we are really needing to have um, a, 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 an ambitious set of actions around cooperation. We need to be co-defining the research questions and we need to be looking and working with private sector and civil society. The second webinar was about germplasm health. And there, the main points were that these, this health is absolutely crucial. It's threatened by globalization, threatened by movement, and that we really need to be working at all the different levels to keep our seeds clean and healthy. Um, and then there are some actions identified here. We need to be looking at those gaps, promoting best practices, new technologies, and really the gender lens is most important. I can see people are putting their hands up on the Zoom. We're not going to be putting the mic sharing the microphone. We have, uh, if you have a comment or a question, please use the chat. I'd like to introduce our two organizers for today. Dr. Prasanna is, um, works for the CIMIT in Nairobi, and he is the science lead for this event. He's been the main organizer of all of this. And uh, his colleague, Dina Ibabao, works for the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, and she's been organizing everything around the communications. So appreciation to our two colleagues there. I'm going very quickly, just as time is a bit tight, we want to get to the real meat of the event. So the agenda, we're doing a kind of an introduction now. Um, in a moment, I will hand over to the moderator. We then have four great presentations for you where we invite you to interact, to ask questions, to comment, then we'll have a reflection, a kind of a conversation, and then we'll close around two o'clock GMT. It might be a few minutes after that. Um, that's what we're aiming to do. I think the next thing I'm going to do now is we're going to show you a short, very short video. And so Tundi, I'm going to stop sharing. If you could provide this very short video that our colleagues at Simit have prepared. So over to you, Tundi, to show us the video. Oh, I'm seeing a very interesting mix of people on the chat. Nini and Masimba. Their maize farm in Zimbabwe has been providing for their family for generations. One day while working in their field, they discovered dozens of insect larvae. They were fall army worms. Anini and Masimba had never seen these insects before and worried about how to protect their crops. Within days, the pest had eaten its way across the field, destroying their hope for a good harvest and food for their family that season. They soon learned that the fall armyworm is an invasive pest that eats more than 80 different crops, but has a particular preference for maize. Fall armyworm is native to the Americas. It was first reported in Africa in 2016 and quickly spread throughout the continent. In less than two years, it affected maize crops in more than 40 countries smallholder farmers were badly hit. In 2017, some lost up to 50% of their harvest. It reached India in 2018. It has since been reported in many other countries across Asia and the Pacific, and it reached Australia in 2020. Millions of families in these regions are highly dependent on maize for their income and their livelihoods. If the fall army worm keeps spreading, it will have disastrous consequences for them. It is estimated that the pest has caused around $3 billion worth of damage to maize crops across Africa. Without further management, it could cause much more damage to crops in Asia and the Pacific. Scientists at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, also known as CIMIT, have been working hard to find solutions to help farmers fight fall armyworm. Researchers have developed manuals for farmers with guidelines on how to manage this pest. They have also formed an international research consortium where experts from diverse institutions are sharing knowledge and best practices. Consortium members share updates on progress in finding new ways to tackle this global challenge. The fall armyworm can't be eradicated. It is here to stay. Scientists are now working on developing new maize varieties that are resistant to fall armyworm. 
Simit and its partners worldwide will continue to work on this complex challenge so millions of smallholder farmers like Anini and Masimba can protect their crops and feed their families. For more information on fall armyworm and Simit's work, please visit simit.org slash fall armyworm. Thank you very much, Tundi. We hope you got inspired by that short video. Um, I would like now to introduce our moderator, Dr. Rob Bertram. Rob Bertram is the chief scientist at the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at the US Agency for International Development. So Rob, over to you, if you could introduce, tell us why we're here and um, introduce the process with the panelists. Great, thank you, Peter, and welcome everyone. I see we have almost 300 people on the line. That's fantastic. And I've been watching you all click in and it's truly a global audience. So this is a, a wonderful silver lining of the situation we're in that we're able to convene these global gatherings on important topics. And as, as Peter said, this is the third in the series of the CGIR International Year of Plant Health, Health webinar series. And special thanks to, to, I, uh, to Simit and Erie, but also to IITA who are, are also helping out in, in convening us all today and just showed us that beautiful video. Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the messages that's coming through that we think about in this space is that we're living in a shrinking world. We have trade, we have travel, and as Peter related, we have climate change, which was the subject of the the, the last in the series or the, the one before this. Um, but these things are driving uh, uncertainty and vulnerability for farmers around the world. Uh, and in just in the last 10, 11 years of Feed the Future, we've had maize lethal necrosis disease. We've had the fusarium wilt of tropical race four and bananas. We've had the fall army worm that was just referred to, the locust outbreak, which was unprecedented in recent memory, uh, wheat blast in, in, in Asia, in, in Bangladesh. So we've seen how much the interaction of trade, uh, travel, and, and climate change and, and climate variability can, can drive uh, new, new problems occurring. Um, these are by nature regional threats, so we need countries and global partners like the CGIAR to work together. Uh, we need better ways to prioritize uh, the damage that's being caused. And I'm really happy that the Gates Foundation and CABI and others are working together on the global burden of crop loss index. This is a, a, an important breakthrough uh, in terms of really understanding how big this burden is. Uh, this will help, of course, with prioritization. And I'm also very pleased to mention that here in USAID, we are uh, launching, just in the next couple of days, uh, the, uh, a call for a new Feed the Future Innovation Lab on current and emerging threats to crops. So this will be biotic threats, uh, pests and diseases, of course, among them uh, as, as main focus. Um, I think some of the work in that lab may also include innovations in surveillance. Uh, We've, we've already seen the advantages that can come from digitized uh, mobile uh, pest lists and the, the way that they can put knowledge in the hands of farmers and extension workers. We've seen the role of research networks. I can't, I can't underscore how important even loose connections amongst global researchers are in, in identifying, flagging, and ultimately helping mobilize the science we need it's that combination of science, partnerships, global partnerships, and knowledge, the knowledge that comes from those to really help all of us be better prepared to avoid the kinds of losses that we've seen, for example, with fall army worm in the African situation. So today we're gonna see what this looks like in practice. Uh, we've got a great panel uh, on, uh, the theme of course is protecting plants and people. Uh, we are going to include a speaker on, on livestock as well. I think that's wholly appropriate when we think about a One Health approach. Uh, you know, we think about plant health, we think about environmental health, we think about animal health, and ultimately human health. That's really the, the One Health concept. So that's going to be reflected in our speakers today as well. 
So with no further ado, I'd like to turn over now, Peter, with your permission to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Prasanna from, he's director of CIMIT's Global Maze Program and the CGIR's um, uh, director of the maze uh, program. He's uh, based in India and, and Kenya. And uh, Prasanna has been at the forefront of, of this kind of work, particularly in, with respect to maize. And there have been, as I've said, multiple threats in that space. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking to us today about tackling transboundary diseases and insect pests of crop plants, successes and challenges. So Dr. Prasanna, great pleasure to turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. Uh, uh, Peter, can you confirm whether you can hear and see my presentation? Yeah, it's, it's okay. good. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, many, many thanks to Rob for uh, technically moderating this important webinar and to the great panelists that we have from different centers, different institutions, and an overwhelming response from the participants to uh, to participate in this particular webinar. Uh, I'm going to uh, speak uh, very quickly through this very important topic on tackling transboundary diseases and insect pests of crop plants. Uh, what are the major successes and challenges? Uh, over the last several years, we have seen increasingly the spread of crop pests and pathogens rapidly across the globe. And this has uh, devastating impacts on the agri-food systems and the smallholders. Uh, several prominent examples, the fall on Iwam across Africa and Asia, uh, maize lethal necrosis, as Rob uh, referred to, wheat rust and wheat blast in Africa and Asia, uh, banana, bunchy top virus, bacterial wilt, fusarium wilt race, TR4, cassava brown streak virus, papaya mealybug, potato cyst nematode, taro blight. There are many more such examples of crop diseases and uh, pests that have been spreading very rapidly across uh, the world. And this has undoubtedly massive economic implications. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, fall amiwam, as the video showed, this has uh, a devastating impact on smallholders, both in Africa and Asia. The wheat rust, as you can see, uh, has quickly spread from one continent to another continent, again, affecting wheat crops, uh, especially for the smallholders. So what is what are the reasons for the expansion of these outbreaks. There are several, uh, infected seed or planting material, uh, vector movement, a strong migratory capacity of some pests. For example, the fall of Miwam can travel more than 500 kilometers uh, before, uh, it's, uh, before it completes its life cycle. Uh, contaminated field equipment, as you can see here in case of uh, the wheat rust, the spores, contaminating the wheels. And if you go into another clean field, naturally it will spread the disease. Uh, seed is a carrier of some of the major pathogens, improper crop production and commercialization practices. And uh, amidst all this, there is also uh, a, a strong likelihood of uh, pathogens and pests moving through the international air and sea traffic. Uh, prevention is undoubtedly better than cure. Uh, but prevention as well as control of transboundary diseases and pests require uh, a holistic strategy and multi-institutional strategies. Uh, here are synergies. So if you see here, integrated pest or disease management is the confluence of several facets. Surveillance and early warning is undoubtedly the key. Uh, and once you detect a pest or a pathogen, how quickly you can respond to it uh, for either eradication or containment. Uh, controlling or reducing the impact, again, requires uh, an integrated approach, host plant resistance, good agronomic management, uh, biological control, biopesticides. Uh, there are a number of integrated pest management tactics that need to be effectively integrated uh, based upon the agroecological landscape and socioeconomic context of the farmers. Uh, here is one strong example of integrated disease management, the maize lethal necrosis, which appeared in 2011 in Kenya, then rapidly spread to several countries across Eastern Africa and threatened to uh, destabilize the maize production in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, what CIMIT together with partners, the national plant protection organizations, 
National Agricultural Research System partners, as well as the commercial seed companies could do is to implement a holistic strategy, not only breeding and deploying MLN resistant varieties, but also MLN providing checklists for commercial seed companies for producing MLN free disease, uh, disease free seed and exchanging them uh, to the countries that they are usually uh, sending the, the seed. Rigorous monitoring and surveillance, uh, infusing economic, proper economic management practices, capacitating the partners on diagnostics uh, and the management of the disease. Uh, all these things together contributed to preventing uh, a, a large spread impact of uh, MLN in Eastern Africa, as well as the spread of this disease to major maize growing countries uh, in Southern Africa and West Africa. Uh, yet the disease is not eradicated and we cannot keep uh, our God low. Uh, we need to continue to protect these countries from MLN. Uh, crop disease and pest surveillance for early warning and emergency response over, a, over the last several years, excellent examples have come through. For example, the rust tracker in case of wheat rust is one of the largest uh, uh, disease surveillance systems uh, that is available in any crop plant. The MLN web portal gives you information about the range of measures that have been taken on uh, uh, MLN surveillance across Africa. The Kasava virus disease mobile apps, uh, again, uh, tremendous work done by IATA and partners. But I would like to draw the attention of this excellent uh, paper published in Science uh, recently on a global surveillance system for crop diseases. This article authored by uh, University of Minnesota colleagues talks about the need for not only uh, boosting the general or passive surveillances of pathogens and pests, but also increasing our efforts on specific and targeted surveillance. We also need to strengthen the capacities of partners, especially in the low income countries on multiple fronts, targeted as well as passive surveillance, risk assessment, diagnostics, data sharing, and communications. And these communications need to be from global to local and local to global. It has to be bi bi-directional. On the host plant resistance front, there have been excellent examples, especially from the CG system on proactive deployment of disease resistant varieties. Two specific examples I will highlight here, nearly 140 plus wheat varieties uh, with improved agronomic traits, disease resistance and climate resilience have been deployed in 11 at-risk countries over the past 10 years. This is a massive deployment, proactive deployment of uh, disease resistant varieties in case of maize. Similarly, when wheat blast was first detected in Bangladesh in 2016, by 2017, the CIMIT wheat team, uh, together with the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute, could uh, release Barry GOM 33 uh, in Bangladesh. By 2020, several wheat blast resistant varieties have been released in Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. Another very strong example of proactive deployment. Another important way in which we can curb the diseases is also customized deployment of disease resistant varieties. Uh, tremendous work done in this regard by the IRI colleagues, the IRI team. I particularly enjoy reading this article a few years back on decision tools for bacterial blight resistance gene deployment in rice-based agricultural ecosystems. How a resistance toolbox looks like, what is the role of mark resistant breeding and genome editing together with pathogen surveillance, disease forecasting uh, will enable you to deploy customizedly uh, these resistant varieties in different geographies. So this is an excellent example of integrating diverse aspects, epidemiology, diagnostics, disease models, breeding, seed systems, and information and communication technologies. Uh, the next most important thing, this, Examples are not just limited to the cereal crops. Uh, here is an excellent uh, work that has been done under CRP roots and tubers, uh, especially in potato and sweet potato disease and pest management. Major resistance genes for many viruses of potato as well as late blight have been identified, cloned and markers developed. Uh, advanced sensitive and field deployable diagnostics have been deployed in sweet potato. Continental late blight monitoring networks have been set up 
along with simple decision support tools and systems for late bright management. Integrated pest management packages have also been developed for insect and bacterial wilt management in potato and for the sweet potato weevil. Uh, thanks to the wonderful work done by SIP and partners across uh, different continents. Fala Mivam uh, is another uh, elephant in the room. Uh, this is now a major challenge in Africa and Asia. There is no single solution that can provide sustainable management of this pest. And there needs to be, there is no other better example than putting together all our brains and synergies, institutional synergies in sustainably tackling this major pest. Uh, excellent examples are now emerging both from Africa as well as in Asia on biological control agent, how to mass produce and release them. Biopesticides are now being increasingly registered, especially uh, multiple uh, polyhedronucleoviruses based or baculovirus based uh, uh, biopesticides. Agroecological management, again, excellent work being done by ECP as well as CIMIT and other partners on diverse ways in which we can manage uh, uh, this pest through agroecological based approaches. On native genetic resistance, CIMIT uh, team, I'm very proud, have recently released three fala one tolerant hybrids uh, and several countries in Africa are now gearing up for national performance trials uh, in the, the more than 10 to 12 countries are now working intensively on deploying them through national performance trials. BT maize is already deployed, uh, not only in South Africa, but also in Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, approvals have also come from Pakistan, but it is yet to be commercialized. Indonesia and China look very positive for deploying BT maize. So this is another powerful tool in the toolbox. So good news, several solutions are emerging on multiple fronts, but sobering it is to know that it, there is still a tremendous scope for integration and wide scale deployment of these technologies through specific IPM packages. So last two slides, uh, in terms of integrated disease and pest management, there are several challenges to overcome. New and more aggressive pathogens or pests are emerging and spreading globally. Uh, there is rapid evolution of fungicide and pesticide resistant strains or biotypes uh, for different crop pests and pathogens. IPM based solutions are either not available or affordable to the smallholders still, especially in low and middle income countries. And there are policy bottlenecks to overcome uh, in many countries in Africa and in Asia. Uh, there is inadequate investment uh, at various levels in terms of integrated disease management and integrated pest management research for development. And to me, IPM is not just integrated pest management. It's also about integrating people's mindsets. And that remains a major challenge. We need to think beyond our narrow disciplines, narrow institutional interests, and really come together to put powerful IPM packages uh, in farmers' fields. What can we collectively do better? General as well as targeted surveillance of key pests and pathogens in areas with highest risk uh, determined by modeling improved access to monitoring and surveillance data, and fostering the use and interoperability of digital tools for effective pest and disease management. We also need to intensify our efforts on developing and deploying more durable and robust sensors or tools so that we can have sensitive, easy to use, and affordable on-site diagnostics for detecting pathogens proactive and customized deployment of disease and pest resistant crop varieties uh, should be cutting across different crops, not just a few. Uh, and there is a tremendous need for capacity building of national programs, as well as the national plant protection organizations, especially in the low and middle income countries on modern diagnostics and disease and pest surveillance tools. And last but not the least, formulating and implementing IPM packages relevant for different agroecologies, cropping system landscapes, and socioeconomic context of the farmers uh, is indeed the need of the other. Uh, several colleagues from CIMIT, wheat program and maize program, uh, colleagues from IRI, IITA, uh, special thanks to Lava, uh, Nina, Jan Cruz, Regina, Joe Huising from USAID. Uh, they are all contributed to this wonderful effort that I have outlined here. 
There are also several partners across Africa, Asia, and the Americas who are part of our Research for Development Consortium. Many thanks to USAID, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the CGR Research Program, Window One, and two donors. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Dr. Prasanna, for that wonderful overview uh, uh, filled with all kinds of, of compelling examples and also, I think, uh, observations. Uh, one thing that strikes me here listening to you is the, the, the power of the one CGIR of being able to speak globally the way you just have across the major uh, staples. Um, you mentioned um, uh, think the role of the private sector, for example, whether it's in plant protection or even biological control, uh, seeds. Uh, also, I guess I would add to that the issue of functional responsive regulatory systems, whether it's for new crop yes, varieties, for uh, new technologies like BT, or for uh, new uh, chemistries or other uh, biological uh, control efforts. Yes. So it's really about integration, as you say. And I really liked your idea of local to global and global to local. Uh, I think that's that's really came through. And our next speaker is, I think, going to help us understand the local end of that and how it connects to the global. I'm very pleased to welcome. Oh, Peter, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. I'm jumping ahead. Let me stop and turn it back to uh, Peter. No problem. We wanted to give a chance for the for our colleagues in the audience. We would like to um, follow up each each uh, presentation with a very quick interactive exercise with all of you. So we, we have, in this case, a chat exercise. So what we'd like you to do, think for a second or two, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, what's the greatest integrated plant pest disease management success that you have seen? If you could just post that quickly in the chat, what success have you seen? And then we will, uh, for the following presentations, we will do a little poll. But for this one, we wanted to warm you all up with the chat message. Thank you. Uh, okay, that's a, a nice, um, message from Lalit there, please, colleagues. What's the biggest success, the greatest success you have seen? Just post it in the chat very quickly for us. Okay. Victor says UG99. I'm hoping that Rob knows what that is. Um, somebody says M. So what are we seeing? So, Rob, these things should just, we should get a couple dozen, 30, 40, 50 chat messages coming through. And maybe there's something you'll see here which is particularly surprising or not surprising. Um, so keep on, please, posting your, what is the biggest successes? So Rob, I don't know why you, are you seeing, are you able to keep up with the flow of all these points from the folks? I, I, I am watching actively, and what I see is a historical arc emerging. Somebody talked about the cassava mealybug and green mite, which is one of the greatest contributions of CGIR research, was led by IITA and CIOT to bring the biological control of introduced pests into Africa still giving us billions of dollars of benefits. And then UG99 and wheat rust have been mentioned. Uh, uh, again, something that really, um, Norman Borlaug spent the last years of his life warning the world about the resurgence of, 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 of wheat diseases that we thought had been vanquished, but had evolved new races. And of course, this is underscores the need for the kind of research networks that we're talking about. And we're seeing lots of other ones that have been historically important, like bull weevil in the US, um, uh, the maize ne lethal necrosis. I, let, me, let me see if I can go up and down here. There's so many coming through. Uh, okay. uh, oh, Tuta absoluta, which is another one of these globally moving press on the move. Uh, uh, I, see, uh, I see coconut diseases. It really, you know, it, it, there's something everywhere. Actually, there's more than one thing everywhere, right? Looks like it. Okay, so one more chat. Thank you very much, everybody. That's giving us the biggest successes. Now I want you to think about what are the biggest challenges you think you have seen? What are the biggest challenges you've encountered? Implementing integrated best management. Is it indeed that integrated, what was it, the, the personality management that, um, no, that wasn't the right word. The, the, that, uh, integrating, about. So what are the biggest challenges? Mindsets. Integrating mindsets. people's mindsets. Yeah. So please post, uh, if you can, please, the biggest challenges. So Rob, what are we seeing? Biggest challenges? Uh, well, I see 
issues around awareness and adoption by farmers, uh, generating that awareness. In other words, the communication where we do have new tools and they're really, I think we'll probably hear something about how the tools are being used. Um, let's see, we have weak regulatory systems, lack of funding, uh, the, the issue of labor, uh, very important. Whoever, somebody raised that in terms of the, the burden of time uh, uh, for women in particular, uh, in terms of trying to manage uh, and adopt new technologies. Uh, local support in countries that are being affected. Oh my goodness, they're coming in so fast and furious. <laughs> uh, certainly a shortages of, resorts, of resources is a recurrent theme, Peter. Yeah. Asana, last chance. What, what have you seen? Any, anything from the challenges which is surprising to you or, or com completely uh, confirming for you? Not so surprising, but uh, there is a lot of reverberating theme is about uh, political will and commitment, uh, information, communication, uh, awareness. Uh, so there, these are reverberating uh, themes that are uh, coming up. I think uh, this is, this is uh, truly important to get this kind of feedback from uh, participants who are now almost 345. Uh, to get this kind of feedback is truly amazing. And uh, it's, uh, this is really good. We'll compile all this uh, information uh, in, uh, in a very forceful manner. So thanks a lot. Keep on, let it keep coming. Uh, and we, we encourage you to submit your thoughts. Uh, thank sure. you. Thank you. So I'm gonna hand back to you, Rob. Um, I, will keep on, I will keep on moving the slides from now on, but I will turn my, my, my microphone off so um, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I think what we've been doing these last couple of minutes is a great introduction to our next speaker. She's Dr. Nozomi Kawarazuka from the International Potato Center. And I hope she and my other SIP colleagues on the call will forgive me for not having mentioned SIP in my earlier introduction, the International Potato Center. So Dr. Kawarazuka is a social anthropologist uh, with SIP. She's based at, in Hanoi, Vietnam. And her research is focusing on gender and social dimensions of technology adoption, agricultural innovation, and food systems. So really right at the heart of many of the observations that people have been sharing over the last several minutes. And she leads the uh, strategic gender research in the CGIR's Root, Tuber, and Banana program. So welcome, uh, Dr. Kawarazuka, over to you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Peter, can you um, uh, already mean? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about gender and social dimensions. Uh, this presentation is a collaboration work with World Fish, uh, ELI, the Alliance, IITA, and RTV SIP. We present how gender matters and what a big difference in adoption of technologies. Next, please. So this is a call for collaboration to biophysical scientists. Why? Because most constraints can be managed by using already existing technologies and the best agronomy has voluntary practices. The challenge is how to apply it in the field with varied social and cultural context. Failure to address gender and social norms runs the risk of farmers rejecting your technologies or your technologies are not reaching to targeted social groups. Therefore, collaboration between social and biosci biophysical scientists is essential. Next, please. So our current uh, main challenge is a distance between social scientists and biophysical scientists. We don't talk much about this, but actually exist. We want to collaborate, but there are full of barriers between us, such as fear to talk with gender researchers our language we use are very different. Epistemological belief is different and no trust uh, between us. It is a bit uncomfortable for you to move beyond your disciplinary area, but if you move one step, then collaboration starts. Uh, next, please. So one example is Iri Bet, uh, Harry Kiara. I love this YouTube, very short YouTube video that he talk about gender. He said that first, uh, he was not convinced at all about gender, no, nothing related. 
Then he just made a list of women participants to satisfy donors. But then what really changed his mindset was a study on adoption of vaccine that he conducted together with social scientists. So many, many people have to pass through this process. First, you are not convinced, and then try just a list of women farmer participation, tick box. But then when you move to the next process of collaborative research, then uh, you can really enjoy uh, the interesting research we can do that. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to present example cases of how gender matters, uh, five cases. The first case is from Ethiopia, uh, gender matters in collective action in a community uh, like COVID virus spread in the community if someone is not careful. Therefore, in this community decided to make rules by uh, providing fines that those who don't follow the rule, you should pay fine. However, they realized that female-headed households or poor households have particular challenges to follow recommended measures. So in this case, fine cannot be incentive. Instead, the community decided to provide uh, subsidies for female farmers. That was a key of, for success to protect uh, potatoes in all communities. Uh, next slide, please. So next case is gender matters in banana disease management. This is a case from East African Highland. In this region, banana is traditionally grown by men and therefore training for banana was provided to men because its ownership is men. However, women grow beans by using banana stem as a support. Uh, here, if we, the training is only provided to men who are often even absent from the village because of migration, it is extremely inefficient. Understanding ownership, male crop and female crop, that is not sufficient and complex gendered life, lifestyles, ne? including migration and also broader crop systems are very important. This case, you know, she, she realizes my, my husband's banana is sick, but by, my beans are doing fine. If she are not trained, she cannot cut stems and because that ownership is husband. So both husband and wife should be trained that the, so that she can cut even, she will waste her beans. Uh, next slide, please. So the next case, the message is breeders best choice may be rejected by women. So this is the case from cassava disease in West Africa. The spread of disease is a very serious issue and re replacing with new disease tolerant variety is considered as a solution. So breeders can recommend this is the best disease tolerant variety. You should replace it. But uh, yield is also high because this is a from breeders perspective. Uh, but farmers can say, no thanks, US is not suitable for processing. So preference are often ethnicity specific, uh, culinary orientated and culturally uh, orientated. Therefore, understanding their preference trait in given cultural context is very important. You cannot uh, use only one variety for whole entire Africa or entire world. So it has to be context specific, otherwise the adoption rate will be low. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the message is early collaboration makes a big difference. Uh, in early, overuse of antibiotics is a global problem, as you know and a, a typical example of failure of considering farmers' behaviors in the process of dissemination. Now, it is developing alternative biocontrol technology instead of antibiotics. And this case, an ELI laboratory researcher approached to a gender researcher before the project starts. So she said, we haven't developed actually project, the product yet. So then the researcher said, let's do research to find out understanding farmers' needs, practice, and behaviors. This enables interdisciplinary team to co-design innovation. Many technologies and innovation are developed by biophysical scientists alone and organized training to women farmers how to use them, which is not a right approach. Farmers have to be involved from the developing technologies. Next slide, please. 
So the last case is from World Fish. A message is involving women expert and extension workers in the male dominant fish health sector is essential as women farmers are responsible for farming. Like this case, uh, men are often working on the farm. Women are looking after fish. So World Fish hires female fish health scientists and researchers in both Asia and Africa as a gender transformative strategy. This changes male dominant culture, bias, and perceptions. And also in South Asia, for example, women farmers hesitate to talk with male government extension workers. So female researchers and extension workers reduce this barrier. So what I want to say is a gender and social diversity in this sector, sector fish or plant health sector, is an entry point to develop innovation that are acceptable to women as well as men and scaling up of those innovation in the community. Next slide, please. So this is the advertisement RTV we developed frequently asked questions for extension workers and ag agronomists about gender and pest and disease management. This also shows how to collect gender disaggregated data more appropriately, also how to interact with farmers. Six local languages are available online. So the last slide, please. So in this last slide, I'm going to propose potential areas for collaboration toward one CGI AR with uh, partners. So first is a core design innova innovations and interventions, not adding gender as an afterthought. Good example we had from the ELI. Second, a gender disaggregated data collection and analysis to identify gender gaps and also assess impact of technologies on men and women who benefit from that. The third, a platform like this uh, to facilitate interactions may be very useful because to share interdisciplinary experience and lesson learned. Uh, the last three, the concept of one health can be very useful for us, multidisciplinary collaboration in human health, animal health, and environmental health lesson learned from experience of gender and social research in one health can be applied for our CGIAR uh, research. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kuarazuka. That was a, a wonderful uh, tour de force in terms of how, uh, how <clears throat> excuse me, gender and inclusion matters all the way along from the high-end science all the way to the uptake. The other theme I think that you've touched on that is so resonant now is better understanding uh, the needs of the user community. And when we say user community, that could mean farmers, but as you pointed out, it could also be processors, it could be consumers, it can be anyone <clears throat> along, <clears throat> pardon me, along that market system. Uh, so I think getting a better understanding of those kinds of uh, demands the, 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 and the, also the, the issues that were mentioned earlier around labor, uh, uh, who, who's making decisions, um, the whole issue of agency, economic agency in the household. We know this is critical. We used to talk about it a lot with respect to uh, nutrition outcomes, but we know it's critical for economic outcomes. The, 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 the women as, as economic agents and as the communicators. I mean, you really, so thank you so much for highlighting all of this. Uh, Peter, can I turn it back to you for uh, sort of elicit some reactions? Certainly. So we're going to try something different this time. We have prepared a poll for you to see where you sit on the spectrum um, of, of this collaboration spectrum between scientists, technical, biophysical, and gender. So Tunde, you should have the first poll for us, I believe. Yes. I'm going to ask you to choose one of five options from the poll. Um, yeah. Okay, so you should be able to just go here and vote. So the zone has identified five positions on a continuum, I guess, between integrating gender. So if you can vote, you should be able to vote. We're looking for a 50% vote in the next uh, half a minute. 
So I can see we're up to six, seven, eight percent. So please tell us where you are on this. And it doesn't matter if you're at one end or the other. If you do a great deal, that's not a bad, that's not a problem. <laughs> so we're up to 25 percent. So we're going to keep on going. We'll keep it open another 30 seconds, I can see. So please take a vote. And then I don't know whether you could then in a moment we will sh we will end the polling and we'll look at the results. And then Rob and Nozomi can tell us what significance we can draw from these results. We're up to 42%. Very good. Uh, just a few more percent. We're 150 people voted. That's excellent. Let's go a little bit further. I can, we're going to have 48%. So Cindy, I think we can close the poll in a, a few seconds. If you can close it. There we are. This is the results. Okay. We can see the you winner. see the results? Let me turn. Should we turn to Dr. Kawazuka to comment? Is she surprised, or is this is does this look about right to her, from in terms of her experience? I'm surprised. I'm uh, I'm positively surprised that the many people uh, feel like a great deal. Uh, that is uh, excellent. Uh, however, I think that how how it you know how it's worked. That lesson learned is still missing. So I really want you to document. You worked really gender. Please highlight in your success cases and document it more clearly. Actually, people are doing, but uh, that is not, not really visible in pest and disease management research, maybe in social science, but here, not visible. But however, I also concern a lot about the bottom two. There are still, uh, large percent, uh, 30 percent, more than 30 percent, that very limited extent dealing with. This is a gap, and we should uh, consider with the donors, especially that uh, you know, uh, no, no lack of budget is a critical issue. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, and I, I noticed in your talk, Nozomi, that you did flag the is issue <clears throat> and importance of gender disaggregated data. And I have yes. to say, I would be very surprised at this point if people aren't doing that. I, that would be a, a, a great concern for us. I know in Feed the Future, we have worked very hard to promote uh, really conscious, intentional efforts to understand, integrate, and in many cases, promote. Uh, uh, do we have anything else, Peter? This is, all, this is all you have, I'm afraid, for this one. We're going to move on to the next. To the okay. Next. Well, thank you. And, and so, uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, another uh, a critical piece of this. And, and this is uh, a talk from my colleague, uh, Regina Eddy, uh, who's going to talk about uh, transboundary disease and pest management and the role of national, regional, and global organizations. Uh, I'm going to say, in, without any modesty, that Regina knows when she speaks because uh, she has been right on the, the front lines of the fall armyworm fight for years uh, in, in, uh, in, through a global partners with FAO, with the CGIR, with CABI, with uh, many other, uh, uh, the African Union, many other partners. And um, so she's going to tell us about how actors at various scales, national, regional, and uh, global can work better together to to leverage that science into manageable uh, programs and practices to combat disease. She uh, is the coordinator in USAID for the Fall Army Worm Interagency Task Force. And uh, she, she is um, a key person in our uh, new priority at USAID on scaling technologies, which is so dependent on many of the themes that we've talked about, including those just covered by uh, Dr. Kawarazuka. So Regina, uh, with no further ado, over to you. Thank you, Rob, and, and thank you to the panelists and to everybody who's uh, uh, tuned in today. So I'm going to um, draw upon USAID's partnership with CIMIT to respond to fall army worm and focus on how actors can cooperate I'll underscore many of the points that uh, the two panelists so far have um, already outlined in doing this. Uh, next slide, please. 
I do want to mention that all outbreaks, whether pest or disease, are not the same. There's a wide range of severity, and the response pathway to control the outbreak can differ greatly. For fall armyworm, it emerged and spread rapidly with devastating impacts. 45 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa officially confirmed its presence in the first two years. It was not previously known, so there was limited knowledge, experience, and control options. The concerns were yield loss, especially for maize, livelihoods, and food safety. And research from the Americas indicated it would be endemic throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia. Um, as Prasanna mentioned, engagement spanned all sectors of society, research, academic, civil society, donors, private sector, and in Africa, all levels of the government, from extension and advisory services to the national plant protection offices, the national ag research system, regulatory and policy bodies, the regional economic communities and the African Union were all engaged. So a key challenge was how to harness that um, knowledge, those resources, that energy. Next slide, please. Here is a basic innovation cycle. You clarify the problem, you identify effective interventions, including technologies and practices, validate what works, and then move to approval, dissemination, and adoption. We're in the midst of this type of innovation cycle, for example, right now in responding to the COVID-19 outbreak. In agriculture, this cycle can take five to seven years, even more if technologies and markets have to be developed. The goal is a system that's efficient, informed by the needs of the end user, as Rob was just amplifying, guided by evidence and with fast learning loops. But we faced significant bottlenecks. To begin, we didn't fully understand the potential problem posed by fall armyworm. There was no data um, on expected crop losses. We didn't know if the outbreak would persist. And without evidence, it's very hard for governments and donors to commit significant multi-year investments. While there were products widely available in the Americas, given it was a new pest, there was nothing approved for use in Africa. To get regulatory approval takes most countries two to three years. And 300 million smallholder maize farmers in Africa would eventually need the capacity to manage the pest. The scale required was enormous. So I wanna highlight how these gaps were addressed through collaboration and suggest some factors, uh, key takeaways that perhaps contributed to success. And when I say we, very important, I mean broadly the dozens and dozens of institutions that responded who we uh, together with CIMIT worked with. In terms of understanding food security impacts, Kabi and DFID conducted a multi-country survey at two different points in time. This confirmed that fall armyworm could cause significant losses in yield and economic value. We move from anecdote to evidence. Governments asked, is it possible to manage the pest? What are the tools? What should we prioritize? We were able to sponsor a study tour to Brazil along with Embrapa, which is Brazil's research and development agency, for officials from 10 African countries to hear firsthand how Brazil responded to the pest. So why was this effective? Hearing directly from another government, one who had success, and also while doing so had transformed its country from a food aid recipient to a net maize exporter was very inspiring. The messenger was credible. There were dozens of consultations between African policymakers and scientists and their Brazilian counterparts. So there was a lot of substance. And seeing fall armyworm being controlled with their own eyes in a field with side-by-side -side trials showing tech technology approaches, they were surrounded by evidence. Ultimately, to control the pest, farmers needed to manage fall armyworm in their field. While regulators validated product efficacy in a controlled setting, the question is, would it work on farm? and could farmers have success using these tools? What was unique here is that a research partner, a biopesticide company, and an NGO who had robust farmer networks joined together. They each brought unique knowledge and they contributed resources. This allowed a two-year trial with hundreds of farmers and validated 
their success using the product and their interest in continuing that. In East Africa community, we worked on harmonized pesticide registration. I mentioned registering a new product takes two to three years. Each of the six EAC countries has a different process for application, for fees, for testing protocols. This is costly for the private sector and takes time, all while communities are waiting for safe, effective options. So harmonization equals efficiency. You share product trial data across countries that reduces the number of field trials needed by subsequent companies, countries. The harmonized application simplifies the process and the result, fewer barriers to entry, more validated pro products more quickly, ultimately more choices for farmers. What was unique here is we brought companies together with regulators so they could provide direct feedback about difficulties they experienced with the application process. Remember for them, it's a business decision. If they hit too much resistance, they move on to another country. There was initial reluctance to talk to the very people who you are re regulating, but the goal was not to influence, but to inform the process and the dialogue helped to remove unnecessary constraints very quickly. And this is also a good example of building long-term system capacity, which we've talked about already today. The last item was dissemination and extension tools. We did a lot in this space um, in terms of extension flyers when multiple partners contributed to the content, it yielded a stronger product. It also helped us as partners around, align around the protocol and the key messages, and that reduces confusion. Co-publishing with the National Plant Protection Office grounded the information in the local context and increased local stakeholder trust in the information. We also did regional dissemination events, bringing the whole system in the room together, research, plant protection, policy, NGOs, and we made it a learning and evidence exchange. What did we know? What do we need to understand better? This shared problem solving approach, listening and learning together created a very powerful platform for shared action. Next, please. When possible, pulling away some key practices, discuss and agree on principles, make them explicit. It provides a powerful foundation for your efforts. Here are some of the guidelines for our joint work drawn from the Rome Principles for Global Food Security in 2009. All the tools on the table, evidence guides decision-making and the decision belongs to the end user, in this case, the farmer and the government system that supports them. Build capacity to manage today's outbreak and adapt to future shocks. Our mantra became GAP IPM. Support good ag practice to ensure plants have a healthy start and can withstand stress and build the capacity to use integrated pest management in a dynamic problem solving approach. Don't wait for the crisis to start doing this work. Work to align and leverage. We have to avoid duplication and seek synergy with partners. Really, we have to reflect on this one. We cannot tackle the food security challenges ahead alone, full stop. Take time to develop inclusive partner stakeholder and partner platforms, not designed for them, but designed with them. Next, please. So how can we build on what worked and strengthen results? My key point here is to establish common ground early on in the process. The point of leverage is a common vision of success and a way to measure progress. So really thinking with partners, what is the shared vision of where we wanna be in one year, in three years? Do we have the same metrics to um, understand progress towards that goal? The thought here is if you can think of taking a long road trip with others, in my experience, it's the moment when you spread the map out on the table, you put your finger on the end point, which is your destination, when the conversation shifts dramatically, it becomes real. How many miles each day, what road, who will drive the first leg, the planning is tangible. This is the, the image I think um, useful for our collabor collaborative work. Next slide. Here I want uh, just to leave you with this visual image moving from disorder and confusion to collective impact by aligning around goals and strategy. 
If you want more information, uh, there's a social science around this and methodologies emerging. You can Google collective impact. Thank you. Thank you, Regina, uh, for that uh, really a great overview of how uh, we have operationalized the concepts uh, to address uh, an emerging threat. And I think uh, many of the points that uh, Dr. Karazuka ma made and Dr. Uh, Prasanna made in terms of both the science and then understanding the local dynamics and, and perspectives of users, this, uh, you really took that to the global level where you talked about the role of evidence, the role of South-South collaboration, um, developing new evidence uh, in, in situ in a, where the pest has, uh, or a disease has uh, uh, become a problem, a threat. Uh, the issue of policy, and finally, again, this issue of dissemination, knowledge, tools, how do we actually reach uh, uh, farmers? Because something like fall armyworm, yes, it's a global problem. We have all this, but at the end of the day, it de depends on what a farmer does in her field on her half hectare or hectare of maize in, in Malawi or Burkina Faso or some or, 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 or in uh, Nepal. Uh, so at the, this is uh, how it all comes together. Uh, Peter, let me... Uh, how do you want to pull us together here in terms of some of the synthesis? Well, thanks. So we have another poll for you all. So my colleague, good friend Thundi, is going to post the poll. Following from Regina's presentation, we have a poll for you. Just coming up on your screen now, I hope, Thundi, number two. Very good. So this time, we're talking about what is your top investment priority to enhance the integrated management of plant pests and diseases? And if you can vote again, we're looking for a 50% turnout like last time. And then we're going to ask Regina and Rob to comment on what we're seeing. You have some different options here. Um, but surveillance, biocontrol, wide adoption. What are your top investment priority? What is the number one priority? <clears throat> Regina, there was also a couple of comments in the chat that you might, uh, that might be interesting to look at. Somebody, I think, I saw Jan from CIFPA saying that people don't like to um, and for the future too much, here and now. So what are we seeing on the poll? We've got 38% we've got voted. We're creeping up, so, if we can keep going. Peter, I'm not surprised that we're getting a pretty wide spread on this, uh, mm -hmm. in part because, you know, the, as Dr. Prasanna emphasized, it's really about integration of different approaches, and all the speakers have referred to that. So we see, oh, I think we've just closed the, the polling. Yep. We just and, polled it, we should have a result. What's the result? It feels like election night, huh? Well, it, we have two that are sharing the lead, but one of those is any others. So people will be putting their ideas in the chat. But breeding and deploying uh, crop varieties are clearly very important. But we also see biocontrol, we see surveillance, and we see um, predictive models all emerging. Regina, would you like to make any observations on this? I think you're exactly right, and, and so is our um, audience. Uh, one needs to balance all of these, and um, yet I do agree the technologies and really supporting deployment and the capacity at the farm level to use them safely and effectively, they would, uh, they would top um, in my book as well. So I think this is a really um, lined up, aligned group of, of people. Right, we really need all of these, don't we? Uh, Dr. Prasanna, did you want to add something here? I saw you appear there. You're, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I thought uh, maybe if we could have allowed some more time, then uh, perhaps all five would have occupied equal emphasis. Uh, but I think it's a fairly good spread, given the very limited time that we have given uh, right. to participants. I wonder, we just saw Regina's slide with the arrows. I wonder if this is the third arrow or the fourth arrow. The, 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 there's a sequence issue, but there's also that multiple approach issues and they, they, they're both uh, are needed. The other thing I'd just point out here is that I think it would be very interesting at some point, Regina, for us to take a gender lens to the, the whole process that we've seen happen on fall armyworm 
uh, you know, some of the points that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kawazuka uh, flagged would be, you know, we, we could learn also there in terms of uh, where we've perhaps done well, but maybe in some other areas we haven't done as well as we might. I fully agree. I was very inspired by the discussion already today and you, it's, uh, you should never be tacit. We should have a, an explicit understanding and look to do better. I think it's a great yeah. point. Wayne. Intentionality matters. And our, our next speaker is actually gonna take us that direction as well. Peter, I'll, I'll defer to you in terms of when I should, we should move on. We should move on. Okay, great. All right, well, so now um, we're gonna change gears a little bit, but only a little bit, because we talked right at the outset today of the importance of One Health. And our next speaker is Annette Mulema. She's with IDRC, the International Development Research Center, uh, probably known to many in our audience, but IDRC is unique in as much as it is a donor to the CGIR, but also a research partner that conducts its own research. And it's been particularly a leader in the areas that we've been talking about this morning and technology uptake, uh, the roles of in, in, with respect to gender and how, how, how decisions are made, how change occurs. Uh, Dr. Malema is a, a um, she's a sociologist uh, and uh, in sustainable agriculture, a study at Iowa State University, one of our great land grants in this country. And uh, she's also associated with one of my favorite programs, the African Women in Agricultural Research for Development, uh, uh, the Gates Foundation, USAID, the CGIR, and other partners have supported over the years. So um, we're really delighted to have you here, uh, Dr. Malema. You're going to speak to us today on um, uh, transforming gender relations and zoonotic diseases, disease risks through community conversations in rural Ethiopia. So really bringing in that one health piece, but with many of the same principles, I, I bet we're gonna find, hear uh, Dr. Malema talk about in her presentation. So over to you, Dr. Malema. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, yeah, so I'll be sharing uh, work that we did with colleagues um, from Ilary and Ikada and staff from the National Agricultural Research Systems and Extension in Ethiopia. And um, I feel so privileged to have been invited to this platform where you're speaking about crop but you thought Anmol would also be pertinent to share experiences that could work uh, in the crop sector. Peter, next. Yeah, so this work is about uh, um, using community-based approaches to transform zoonotic diseases, disease practices. And this work was done in Ethiopia, as I said, and we all know that Ethiopia has one of the largest livestock populations and the second largest human population in Africa as after Nigeria. And about 80% of the population depends on agriculture and they have direct contact with livestock and other animals, which increases the risk of exposure to zoonotic diseases. Ethiopia ranks high in the health burden of zoonotic diseases, basically attributed to the poor livestock management practices, a general lack of knowledge in zoonotic diseases, but also the common animal source food handling and consumption practices. Gender dynamics, of course, come into play in managing these zoonotic diseases and different household members, men, women, boys and girls, are all exposed to these zoonotic diseases in different ways based on the transmission pathways. Next. So what are zoonoses? Zoonoses are basically diseases passed on from animals to humans. And as I said, the division of labor has a role to play in who has um, a risk of being exposed to a disease. And the exposure uh, varies at different degrees. So this slide shows basically the typical roles that women do in Ethiopia. They're mostly involved in cleaning the barns. And when the barns are dirty, there is a risk of being exposed to brucellosis, uh, chlamydiosis, Q fever, anthrax, and name it. And also milking is predominantly done by women, as well as handling um, meat. And these 
transmission pathways expose them to different diseases. Next. The same applies to the men. The men are typically involved in helping um, delivery. And most of the time it's done without any productive gears. And they're mostly involved also in the markets. They are very much engaged in marketing livestock as well as lottery. And all these expose them to different zoonoses. For example, slaughtering exposes them to anthrax, anthrax uh, leptospirosis, and uh, the, the markets, they're also exposed to similar um, zoonoses or bacteria, and name it. Next. And the children are also not exceptional. They are in direct contact with livestock, and they have less knowledge about the zoonoses. When you look at this boy in the middle, he's consuming raw milk from a goat. And this is a very high risk um, practice. Next. So participatory community engagement and social learning uh, approaches have proven to be successful in developing uh, greater egalitarian collaboration and communities improve their livelihoods. So community conversations is one of the participatory approaches very much community-based. And we tried to test this approach, which has been uh, tested in other sectors, especially the health sector, in transforming behavior that exposes community members to diseases like HIV. So we decided to test this, community, this, this approach at community level to see if at all we could see any changes in gender relations, but also changes in the practices that expose these individuals to zoonoses, zoonotic diseases. And we also wanted to know under what conditions change happens. Next. So what are community conversations? And these are basically facilitated discussions. Um, and community members work with facilitators to collectively identify and analyze issues that are pertinent to them to achieve specific goals. And they normally happen in informal settings. And this gives men and women present voice and it helps them own the decisions they make, the solutions they come up with, but also strengthening the communication between our community members and the service providers. Next. So this was a, um, an action research that uh, we carried out in four communities in Ethiopia. Uh, and these were in three districts. One of the districts is in the Southern uh, region and the other two are kind of uh, slightly in the north, closer to the northern region. And uh, we followed a sequential process in implementing this approach, which started with a situation analysis using participatory epidemiology and gender techniques. And by the way, I'm not a vet, I'm a social scientist. So I'm not very conversant with the technical vet language but uh, we worked with vets. So we did the, the situation analysis and this helped us know what the actual problem was. And we noticed that there was um, an issue with lack of knowledge on zoonosis and how they were transmitted, but also the division of labor was kind of skewed. But in this presentation, I'm focusing on zoonosis. After that situation analysis, analysis, situation analysis uh, we use that information to design the community conversation guide. And after that, we developed a team of local facilitators, men and women. And these are the people that facilitated the conversations and documented the whole process, monitored um, the change in knowledge, attitude and practices. And they also reported back to the communities. And uh, we engaged a cross section of community members, including the farmers themselves, the lesser keepers, people from the administration, uh, journalists, uh, the researchers, name it. We had a wide array of stakeholders that took part in these conversations and we monitored change over time. Next. So just to give you a flavor of the results, uh, this is basically more descriptive, but we did other analysis that added rigor to this analysis. So what changes did we see after these conversations? And by that, we monitored over a period of about one to two months, we'd go back to the communities to document early signs of change in knowledge, attitude, and practices. So some of the practices that were transformed, basically most of them 
most of the communities in the South consume raw meat and raw milk. And this raw milk, raw meat is like a delicacy to them. It was quite difficult for them, for them to shift from eating raw meat. And you notice that in the baseline, both men and women really indicated that they consumed raw meat quite often, and most especially during events. But men actually consume raw meat more, especially on market days. They have money, so they go out and eat meat. But after the discussion, they realized that actually consumption of raw meat is not a good practice. And in the community conversations, men would tell us that actually, if you don't eat raw meat, then you're not manly enough. You're not good enough. That was the attitude they had. So they consumed it to be strong. And the women, uh, most of them pointed out that they were serving raw milk to the children because they thought raw milk was healthy for the children and it made them more kind of resistant to diseases. But after the conversation, there was a transformation where they started boiling milk. And most of the milk is actually processed into butter. So few of them really directly consume raw milk. Another practice that actually were transformed were, um, maybe I'll look at the last one, handling sick animals uh, without protective gears. You notice that before the intervention, most of the community members or the participants had never used any protective gear when handling sick animals. But after the intervention, some of them tried to, just because they were not readily available in the communities, like gloves, you know, the boats. And uh, they improvised by using plastic bags to cover their hands when they're touching animals and they're assisting delivery. And change was happening slowly at a time as they access these tools. So availability of some of these tools um, hinders adoption of some of these practices. And also cleaning the barns. We noticed that many of them had started at least cleaning the barns more often because before the intervention, women would clean the barns like once a month and they would be so dirty, you know, exposing them to these respiratory diseases. But with the engagement of men in cleaning barns, the barns were cleaner. So next. So to conclude, um, community conversations really helped us see some changes in knowledge, attitudes, and practices that expose men and women, boys and girls, to zoonosis. And there were changes in the practices uh, of handling unsafe, uh, of handling animals, but also the consumption of animal source foods. And we used a theory to help us understand how change happened. And then we picked on the self-determination theory which postulates that the internalization of new behavior progresses most effectively if the personal utility of the activity is understood. And this is what the community dialogues really helped us achieve by changing the cognitive and emotional mental models of the participants, which fostered change by recognizing that actually their practices were posing health risks to them. However, although this approach helped us see some changes in behavior, it actually depends on social structures and institutions in place. We had a lot of support from the district officials. And because they had a buy-in, we had the buy-in from the communities. It also depends on the facilitation skills that required training of the local facilitators to ensure that they have the soft skills to enter into the community and facilitate these discussions. And it was also helpful in a manner that wherever we did this intervention, our communities where we had prior interventions. So the complementarity of this intervention with the ongoing intervention helped demonstrate the practical value of the neural knowledge and practices. So those are just insights into the study, but the paper is available and I'm happy to share the publication with you. Thank you very much and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Malema, for that really fascinating uh, discussion of how important awareness and understanding is at the community level. I think it's especially timely, the whole One Health and the zoonoses discussion in our COVID-plagued world. I think uh, the whole world is going to be looking to the food and agricultural sectors to, to do better. And that starts again, you know, global to local, local to global, which starts as, as, as you said. Uh, the other thing that's so critical is that these foods are so critical to nutrition and, and so important for income opportunities as well for smallholders. So uh, great to uh, have these points added to the discussion. 
Uh, Peter, back to you. Thank you, Rob. Yes, we do have a last poll for you. That was our last speaker. So we're going to bring you a poll. Um, I'm hoping that Tundi has the poll for you, poll number three. Tundi, we've got some similar questions. We want you to think beyond zoonosis and beyond life. Think about plant health as well as animal health. Tundi, here we go. Good. So how best should we boost the success of our of local One Health efforts? Is it about women? Is it about capacity building? Is it about involving farmers in research? What do you think are the most important uh, ways to boost the success of local One Health efforts? Think about plants. Don't necessarily worry about zoonoses. And we're going to give you, we keep on going. We're up to 12%. Um, 18, 20, that's good. Our numbers have dropped off slightly, but we're going to, we're zooming up. So please just quickly, what do you think are the best ways to boost the success? And we're calling them One Health because we've been talking here about plant health, human health, animal health. They're all linked together, environmental health. Looks to me, your... Peter, like that, uh, that uh, let's see, fifth one, build capacity of some extension to deliver reliable plant and animal health advice and solutions. I think that comes back to Annette's point about uh, the fact that in many cases, these things are understood. It's, it's a question of getting the knowledge where it's needed, right? I think that, that, that higher vote there probably reflects her message on that. But there's lots of other pieces, right? Involving farmers in research, uh, uh, the, the smallholder context and realities, and the, again, gender. Uh, uh, coming back strongly as it has in every single discussion today. And then uh, incub incubating plant health. I think that probably was further afield uh, for the group, just having listened to Dr. Malema's uh, talk, but uh, certainly um, uh, it is all part of One Health. So it's great to ha have it there and some people uh, did associate with it. Great. Uh, Annette, did you have any comments on what you've seen here? Any surprises? Uh, maybe not a surprise, but it's quite interesting that uh, the majority of us selected capacity development of extension workers. And right, it's good to develop the capacities of these extension workers, and not only extension workers. I think all of us need to develop the capacity to diagnose gender issues. Um, for us to be able to deliver reliable plant and animal health advice, because if at all your advice is not targeted, then it's lost. So, well, it's good to develop the capacities, but helping them to know how to diagnose issues from a gender lens is very critical. And involving women in um, guiding plant and animal health activities, we found this actually very pertinent because even at community level, we realized that the male participants said these issues are very technical for women. They don't understand them. So we decided to exclude them, you know. So, but eventually at the end of the conversation, they realized that actually they understand what we speak about as scientists. So it's important that we engage them. They know, they understand. And when we're collecting data on the knowledge about the narcissists, we realized that there was no major difference between the knowledge of the men and the women. Women are equally knowledgeable. And some of the signs that the men gave were disputed by the women. They said, no, that's not true, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's good that we engage them really in um, research. Thank you very much. So, so Annette, it's, it's really not either or, it's both. I mean, we need, yeah. these things are not mutually exclusive. I think that's the message. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. In terms, of the, in terms of the timing, we're a bit behind time. We're due to finish in a very few minutes. Um, we've had a longer than, in, than I thought interaction around the different questions. Do you want to take a few minutes still to follow up a few issues with the speakers? And we overrun by five or 10 minutes? Um, I can try. Um, I think we've been talking, we've been talking some synthesis all the way along. One thing we might do, uh, 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 Peter, is go back to our four speakers, starting with Dr. Prasanna, who was just magically appeared, uh, to share some uh, perspectives on what they've heard from their others, from the other speakers, how it relates to their own views, their own work, and maybe we can just give everybody a chance to say a few more words. And and if anybody wants to flag, uh, please uh, feel free to to pick up on questions in the chat box as well. I see there are still coming in. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. Very quick thoughts. I think uh, this webinar, uh, I personally benefited a lot in understanding diverse perspectives on uh, disease and pest management. Uh, it's not simply about technological solutions. It's also about community participation. It's also about stakeholder platforms. It's also about engaging women and marginalized communities, uh, building capacities, their capacities, their awareness about understanding what integration is all about and uh, empowering them uh, in a very strong way, uh, not just by research and uh, development institutions, but various actors in the value chain. Uh, I think this, is, uh, this has come across very strongly uh, thanks to the presentations of uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, so technology is one aspect, uh, knowledge dissemination is another aspect and good policies that uh, enable farming communities to access affordable solutions and integrated solutions is the third most important aspect. And all three have come up uh, very nicely through these presentations. I'm immensely grateful to all of you uh, for this excellent webinar. Well, thank you, Prasanna. Uh, let's let's turn now to, to Nozomi uh, from yes. Vietnam all the way around the world. Uh, Nozomi, what would, what would you like to share in terms of reflections? Okay, I want to share two things from the comment I received from participant. One is that women need new technology. I think this is very important comment because earlier with Prasanna's uh, session that people said that why people, farmers don't adapt technology because burden of time, time constraint, and issue of labor, that women are facing these two issues very seriously. So we have to, you know, labor saving technology, not, not labor adding technology. We need mm -hmm. to pro propose labor saving, especially for women's time burdens because they have also reproductive responsibilities. And the second thing is somebody said that women are su subject, subject to their position as a married to somebody. So women are wife, not farmer, farmer's wife. And they, they have to behave as a wife of somebody in the community that sometimes prevent to actively participate. And this is absolutely true. So that the community, women's you know, understanding gender norms and how we can bring women's voices rise and actively participate that we also need to work together with NGOs they are professional uh, to work on women's empowerment. So I really, I had the insightful comment. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that and uh, re reminding us how the, the issue of gender weaves through this whole discussion. Um, uh, Regina, um, can I turn to you? Yes, I think uh, the many points about integration, integrating tools, knowledge, um, inclusion, integrating all people, um, uh, and also integrating with partners. I think that's a really important theme. It does make the work complex, but it is a powerful strategy. The second is a focus on the end user, um, beginning with the end in mind, uh, really, and, and at that point, generating capacity, capacity of people and the system. There's a comment in the chat box I, I really agree with. It's hard to be proactive and think in the future about pest management. Uh, there's so many other stresses on, on any farmer and farm system. This is really true. And that's why focusing long-term on capacity of people and systems, we get knocked off that game a bit when an emergency comes along. But uh, in the end, this is the most powerful lever that we can um, really help all of us advance if, if we keep the focus on that. Regina, you know, that last point uh, you made, I wanna pick up on before turning to Annette, uh, that we shouldn't, it's, what we really need to do is get sort of a systemic preparedness in place where we have the connections, the conversations, the public and private partners, the NGOs and farmer organizations, you know, connecting in ways that make the whole system more resilient when something changes, when a break of a pest or disease, when a new weed is uh, introduced. It, it can be many different things, but having this kind of really connected, uh, inclusive, 
uh, 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 partnerships that are sometimes very uh, uh, informal, but have, having them there really makes a difference. Let's turn now to uh, uh, Annette. Um, Dr. Malema, what, can you, uh, would you like to share any perspectives? Yeah, oh, sure, yeah. What I would say, I mean, I won't dwell so much on what uh, Nozomi has said, but uh, as we introduce these technologies, we should not focus only the, on transforming the cognitive mental models with understanding, you know? We should also venture into changing the emotional mental models. We need to touch the emotions, the feelings of the people we are trying to reach, but also we researchers. If an issue doesn't touch you emotionally, you know it, it's good to do this, but if you're not, you know, transform emotionally, it's unlikely that you change. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a, a challenging but really important issue. Uh, it's it's a global issue, really, uh, but um, certainly affects our work. I think the other thing that I would add to that is that you know when we talk about some of the kinds of uh, vegetables, fruits. Uh, some of the uh, demanding animal source, food, you know, poultry, livestock, fish, the knowledge content keeps increasing, or even just to manage your maize crop better, you know, the, you, the knowledge content that you need is, is increasing, but we have new tools. And, and uh, I think, that, you know, combining those with those conversations of the type Dr. Malema talked about at the community level, with the overlying, overlying analytics that Dr. Kawazuka spoke about in terms of understanding the roles and, and perspectives of women in a context that marries the science that Dr. Prasanna talked about with the organization, really from local to global at, that Regina talked about to really benefit from uh, part uh, the, the perspectives, the insights and the science and information across the board. So uh, it's, 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 it is, uh, we do have new tools. We have uh, better and better science. We can do it more quickly. Uh, we can transmit information more quickly. You know, Annette, I don't know that we can change people's emotional perspectives more quickly. That's, that's one that we're going to keep partnering with social scientists like yourself and, and uh, Dr. Kawarazuka to help us in, in really, um, uh, uh, seeing how you know innovative innovation and science and progress has to be really a community good uh, that 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 everyone can buy into peter is there anything that you want to flag and or any question that you wanted to pitch i'm I haven't probably been doing justice to the many nice comments that have been coming in or, or and probably a few questions You've covered very well. We got quite a few comments and reactions in the chat and people have been reacting to them. People have been asking to make some of those connections you talked about. So some of that connecting is happening, I think. So that's a very positive step. But I think we need to bring together this, um, maybe we have, we have a small wrap up now here where we have a last question and we, and, we, and I will ask Dr. Pasana to give a closing remarks. I think, um, Rob, Rob, unless you have something else you want to no. synthesize with us. No, no that's good. I'm going to start listening and stop talking. Okay, good. So what I want to do, everybody, I thank you. What I'm noticing, we're running a little bit over time, but people are still here. So I'm assuming, I'm thinking that what uh, Annette has said, that you're all emotionally attached to our interaction this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. So please take a chance now to just post one last chat message. I want you to look at this. We'll look at what's on the screen. I'd like to post one chat message. What is the one priority now to advance integrated pest and disease management? Just take a moment in the chat to post that. I've posted the question also. I'm gonna move on now. We're gonna move into our kind of final session. So while you're thinking about what's one priority, I would like to advertise the last uh, webinar in the series. This will be on the 31st of March, a little bit later GMT. This was about One Health. It's now about One Health, plant health for One Health. It's the intersection of plant, human, animal, and ecological health. You can still register for that. Um, so we've already had a flavor today of One Health. It will be the main focus of the meeting on the 31st of March. I'm hoping that lots of people are starting to post into the chat. Yep, if you can please post what you think is the, is the, one, the one priority now to advance uh, 
integrative plant and animal, uh, plant management yeah. health disease, pest disease health. Let's do it for that. And then I would like to hand over, while you're still posting in the chat, please do post. I'm going to hand over to our, our lead organizer, Dr. Fasana. He's going to say a few closing remarks and acknowledge the people who made this meeting possible. So Dr. Prasanna, where are you? I can't see you anymore. Please post <laughs> in the chat. Here. Good, over to you, please. Good. We're a bit behind time, but it's been a really good conversation, yeah. I think. Very, very uh, brief remarks. First of all, uh, immense gratitude to Rob. Uh, <laughs> nobody could have moderated this webinar better than Rob. Uh, his fantastic perspective about uh, global diseases and crop pests and his understanding of the issues at hand and his knowledge about institutions and the priorities. Uh, this has really brought to the fore uh, through his uh, wonderful technical moderation. So Rob, a big thanks to you. Let's give a big hand to Rob for this outstanding moderation. Uh, it's truly a delight uh, to have you spend uh, almost two hours for this meeting and sharing your vision, sharing your wisdom. Uh, and it is I learned in the process. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rob. And uh, I must also thank uh, my esteemed panelists. Uh, and we thought about this instead of simply technical presentations about the technologies, <clears throat> we need to bring a different perspective. And uh, that has really worked very well. Uh, very, very grateful to you, Regina, uh, for, for bringing the local, global, and uh, regional perspectives. Uh, wonderful presentation. Nozomi, you have really stole the show with your graphics and with your insights on gender relations and uh, how best to proactively engage on the gender front. And that is something that we don't do so much uh, in uh, disease and pest management. Many thanks to you, Nozomi for that excellent talk. Uh, Annette, uh, this has really worked well uh, to have you in this uh, presentation related to plant health and bring a perspective from the animal uh, health and how best we can learn as the plant scientific community to uh, from, from the animal health perspective and really make it one health. And by the way, colleagues, uh, there is a, a CGR internal discussion right now on a, on a global uh, One Health initiative, uh, which will which will try and bring to the uh, bring the institutions engaged globally uh, with multiple uh, expertise. For example, some institutions are excellent on disease and pest surveillance. Some are on early warning. Some are on technologies related to disease and pest management. Some are working on the social and anthropological issues. So through this One Health initiative, we would like to bring the partners, partner institutions across the board globally uh, to synergize their capabilities and their complementary strengths uh, for effectively tackling and sustainably responding to the challenges that are increasing in terms of uh, global transboundary diseases and pests. So my many thanks to Nina, uh, Zanina Ibaba from IRI, uh, my co-organizer has done really uh, fantastic effort in terms of putting together everything related to this. I must please give her a big hand. Nina, you are a marvelous colleague to work with and your energy and your, uh, your effort has really paid off. And I must also thank uh, all the fellow CG Center colleagues uh, who are part of the steering committee of this International Year of Plant Health webinar See these colleagues from SIP, IATA, uh, IRI, SIMIT, uh, ILRI, uh, IFPRI. Um, uh, many organizations are involved in this effort and everybody's wisdom uh, is actually what you are seeing through this. So um, final thanks to the speakers, moderator, once again, uh, the group of CG centers, the, the CRPs, the programs that have actually sponsored all this work uh, USAID is a fantastic partner in dealing with these global challenges on diseases and pests. Uh, to every one of you, uh, sincere thanks. And last but not the least, Peter Ballantyne, uh, you did a great job. Uh, please give a big hand to Peter uh, for his uh, fantastic moderation and uh, keeping us all on toes and uh, seamlessly moving from one step to another step. 
Peter, it's a pleasure working with you. Uh, many, many thanks, Peter. Good, thank you all, thank you everybody. As you can see, we were all clapping with two hands and that's an advertisement <laughs> for Annette's- uh, uh, I think we need to also link. have one group picture. Maybe uh, we do a group all, picture, please, so maybe uh, if you want to put your videos on and um, if you yes, try please to get put your photo, videos right? on and uh, uh, we will have a gallery on, view. One last time and one that last will be super, time, then we can then capture have you have all. A gallery view. There we go, and that's the, great. Uh, all that, all those Nina people. Are, Ruth are going to capture the images, screenshots, please. Yes, I will. So make sure you have your own video on Nina. Nina, your <laughs> own video has to come. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Wait, let me just capture this. Okay. We have a lot of people from the different, uh, from all over the world. So I'm not sure how I'm going to capture everyone. This is really exciting. Uh, there will be different, uh, you, if you move your cursor, there are nine screens available. One, wow. two, three, four, four, two. Um, you need okay. to keep moving. You have to be quick because people are logging off this time. To be, we're over our time. We're 15 minutes late. <laughs> okay. Please move. Okay. I'm still nice to see some people from the previous <laughs> webinars are here. Nice to see Jan is here. Yes. Lava was here. Okay. Great. Excellent. All right. And this seminar could not have been successful without the active engagement of the participants. And yes. we're really glad to have people from Africa, Asia, Latin America enthusiastically participating and uh, uh, sharing your thoughts, your observations. Uh, the YouTube video will be there. The link will be shared through our social media channels and uh, that will provide you access to all the presentations and the whole session. Uh, thank you so much once again, all the participants. Uh, Peter, final close up, clo closing thank off. Thank you everybody, thank you very much. And thank you to IITA, to Tunde for running this Zoom at a moment when IITA lost its internet access. Oh my so God. we're really happy. <laughs> We had to overcome connectivity challenges of a very challenging type today. But we're happy you were all with us. So we see you on the 31st of March. Super. We can find with you. one Thank hand you. or two hands. I'm not sure how we do it. Huh? And then, I'm not <laughs> bye sure bye. what the one hand clap is. Okay, bye bye. Great to see you all. You need nice to clap time. with two hands. <laughs> you have to clap with two hands. Good. <laughs> have a nice uh, rest of your week and good luck for your next Zoom meetings. Thank I'm sure you very much. Up. Yeah.